psychiatrics. Um, he has been he has been a, a household name for about 50 years now in private practice pediatrics in Lagos. And he's a quintessential clinical pediatrician. Um, and he's many things to many of us. But on this particular occasion, I wish to acknowledge uh, that he's been very persistent in ensuring that we form this group. He has reminded me about it on a few occasions. So I think it's just right for us to, do, to devote a few minutes to listen to him. I'm sure he has some words of advice for us. So you are welcome, sir, Dr. Ajeni Fuja. I hope the moderator will not mind for, to, to let him have a couple of minutes. Um, we have much to learn from him. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, if, if I can now invite Dr. Ajeni Fuja to say a few things, please. Uh, can, can you please unmute yourself, sir? Yeah. Yes. Your microphone is muted, sir. Yes, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, sir. Yes. yes. Well, thank yes. you very much, Dr. Lawal. And uh, I welcome you all, my colleagues. I've been at this for a long time, as Dr. Lawal said. We pediatrician in uh, private practice, we are uh, by neglecting our worth because without us, children in this country cannot prosper. And I'm glad that this association has been formed. I was very pleased in particular with the, with the enthusiasm which uh, people wrote on the platform. And I thank Dr. Eletu for his uh, unceasing effort in making sure that this thing proceeds. My original plan, as Dr. Lara said, is to form this group so that we will be able to be part of the um, Faculty of Pediatrics, Department of uh, Pediatrician in Private Practice. You can give it any name you like. And then we'll be able to have these as, uh, conferences or webinar or when the uh, COVID thing disappears that we're able to have some uh, talk and so on. Um, I'm not doing this for myself, but uh, to all of us, pediatrics is like uh, a profession. It's not more than a profession, it's a religion. We hear of children, we all share, share and show that. And uh, I hope this uh, association will progress and continue and do well. I welcome you all and thank you very much. And I hope when we have the next uh, PN conference in, um, in the Southeast, I will be able to bring this up in the faculty that there is a department just like the other discipline of private practice. And this has been an older interest, but I don't see why not, because we should be able to educate the young ones coming, uh, coming into pediatrics so that they can do this work properly. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it in the last 60 years, and I hope you continue to enjoy it, and I'm still practicing it. Thank you very much, and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Laura. Thank you, Dr. Elito, for your kind words. Thank you very much, sir. We sincerely appreciate your presentation, sir, and your encouragement all over the years. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Waje, I would like to welcome you to the microphone as we say. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, I have to give honor to whom honor is due. I feel extremely privileged to have to do this, in fact, and grossly inadequate, uh, knowing the caliber of people on this platform. So I'm just going to talk from the bits we've been able to, that we've been able to do in my practice. I'm hoping that we, we're going to use this medium 
to learn and to collaborate with uh, one another. So I'm going to end the poll now, and I would have it again after I have, uh, so everybody, you, um, I guess we all know what answers we've chosen. And then after the webinar, then we'll go over it again. And just to see if uh, we're going to change our minds regarding some of the answers that we've chosen. So I'm ending the poll right now. Okay. And uh, I will just go ahead to share my screen. So my talk today, um, I, I won't even bother to say much since uh, Dr. Leitu and um, my fathers in pediatrics have actually said a number of things. So let me just quickly go through uh, what we have uh, to present today. So we've titled it Kawasaki disease, not as uncommon as we think. And first I'm going to present two cases that uh, we came in contact with at Pediatric Partners Hospital. And then I'm going to go through the definition, epidemiology diagnosis presentation, the differential diagnosis, laboratory findings, echocardiogram and treatment for Kawasaki disease. So the first case, uh, a three month old male, OA, presented to the hospital with one day history of fever and passage of loose stools, no vomiting, cough or congestion. Uh, the max temperature was 38 centigrade axillary at home. Prenatal care was unremarkable, was the term pregnancy, was a normal vaginal delivery. Uh, vitals on presentation, temperature was 38.5 rectally, pulse was 158, respiratory was 40, his weight was 5.98 kilograms and that put him at the 50th percentile for his age. His physical exam on the, first, on the day he presented, he was alert, uh, well nourished, well developed, he was not in any apparent distress, the capillary refill was brisk. The anterior fontanel was flat and soft. Um, head, eyes, ears, nose and throat uh, examination was marked unremarkable. Everything looks normal to the uh, physician that saw. Chest, cardiovascular and abdomen was also said to be unremarkable. The skin was of normal toggle. So assessment of fever to rule out cause and diarrhea were made. And some labs were done, a complete blood count, malaria parasite being where we're at, fecal opal blood, stool microscopy, and urinalysis were ordered. Uh, white blood cell count was 6,000, uh, granulocyte 58%, lymphocyte 42%, hemoglobin was 9.4, hematocrit 30.5, platelet count was 327,000. Malaria parasite was negative. Page, the baby uh, on that presentation did not have, did not make any uh, stool and uh, they were not able to collect the urine. So mother was counseled, was given antipyretics, was instructed to return if no improvement in 24 hours. But mother presented the next day with the baby to say that the axillary temperature was now 39 centigrade, even with round the clock antipyretics. So a repeat blood work was done, urine exam at that time was uh, collected and <clears throat> the white blood cell count the next day was 8,300. Granulocyte 67%, lymphocyte 33%. Uh, the reanalysis was negative for protein, white blood cells, or nitrite. The specific gravity was normal. So she was once again counseled to continue on antipyretics. But mother got a little flustered and decided to go to another hospital for a second opinion. The new hospital made the diagnosis of tonsillitis and anemia. So the child was admitted at tonsillitis, and this child is four months old, and started on IV antibiotics. Patient was still having high fever, even after 48 hours of IV antibiotics. And after persistent fever, even with the IV antibiotics, mother insisted that she wanted a second opinion from the pediatrician at Pediatric Partners Hospital. Remember, she was initially at Pediatric Partners, but because she just believed that the child was not doing well. So she went to another hospital and they made a diagnosis of tonsillitis and anemia, admitted the child started on IV antibiotics. But while there, she insisted and it was a good thing that we had collaboration with the private uh, pediatricians around. So yes, we went to see the child at that hospital. The child appeared plethoric, was red when we saw the blood and the, the child was undergoing blood transfusion at that time. Of note were injected palms and soles and red edematous scrotum. The lips also appeared pink 
and there was some element of conjunctival injection. Now, the blood, uh, the blood test, the complete blood test done at the other hospital showed uh, the level of anemia and the platelet count had actually gone up to 500,000. And then an uh, ESR was made, uh, uh, done, showed an ESR of 89 uh, um, millimeters per hour. So a presumptive diagnosis of Kawasaki disease was made. So we got an urgent echo and this showed some degree of dilatation of the anterior coronary artery. The patient was immediately started on high dose aspirin and arrangements made for IVIG. The parents decided to have their child flown outside the country to continue treatment in the UK. While in the UK, uh, they still were communicating with us. The child received IVIG and um, there wasn't much uh, coronary artery dilatation. The child followed up several times with the, um, with the cardiologist in the UK and was given a clean slate of health um, after about a year of follow-up. So case B, EO is a four-year-old male, known patient of our hospital and up to date on vaccinations, admitted with a four-day history of fever, generalized itchy rash, strawberry tongue, bulbar conjunctival injection with no exudates. Patient had been seen twice at our hospital earlier in the week, but admitted due to worsening fever and erythema of the hands and feet with conjunctival injection. In fact, the, this child presented on a weekend and the admitting medical officer you know, called to uh, inform uh, both pediatricians, myself and my other pediatrician that, you know, this child definitely looks like he may have Kawasaki. So laboratory investigations revealed white blood cell counts of 9,100, hemoglobin and hematocrit of 11.9, 37.2 hematocrit, platelet was 438,000, the CRP 27.8. Urinalysis was within normal limits, liver function tests and renal function tests were normal. The COVID antigen test was done and it was also negative. Blood culture done showed no growth. So we commenced the child on IV antibiotics, antipyretics and oral antihistamine, just trying to see what else this could be. That's why being on round the clock antipyretics, IV antibiotics, he continued to have fever spikes as I as 39 centigrade axillary. Malaria test was repeated twice and both were negative. By third day of admission, that was day seven of fever, the swelling and hyperema of the palms and soles were more prominent. Child still had bouts of itching. Echocardiogram was done, which showed dilatation of the left main coronary artery and the right coronary artery involvement as well. The consultant cardiologist recommended to commence on high dose aspirin and IVIG. High dose aspirin was commenced immediately at 80 milligrams per kilogram. Body weight divided Q6 hours, so fever abated after 48 hours and then uh, was commenced on low dose aspirin after um, uh, 48 hours of uh, low fever. So we discharged the child home after the child had the infusion of IVIG and was con continued on low dose aspirin daily. Uh, he's scheduled for a checkup with the cardiologist at one week and six weeks post IVIG infusion. Uh, we saw him in our clinic about two weeks ago and he's still doing very, very, very well. Uh, discharge instructions included not administering any live vaccines for up to a year after IVIG administration. So what exactly is Kawasaki disease or Kawasaki syndrome as some people would call it? Uh, just a little history. It was actually described by a Japanese pediatrician in 1967 uh, by name of Dr. Yomisaki Kawasaki. And at that time, he, he described a case of uh, febrile illness in children with a um, mucocutaneous um, um, affiliation as well. Now, when he first described this uh, as a febrile illness with mucocutaneous lymph node involvement, we did not know, or then we, it was not known that there was cardiac involvement. But autopsy examination of children that died with uh, of this syndrome revealed cardiac involvement and that was so by the uh, 70s the cardiac involvement was also um, used as part of uh, Kawasaki uh, disease or syndrome. So the definite it's defined there is no definite diagnostic test to say that you know you do this test and it says yes Kawasaki no Kawasaki you know so but it's a, a, a series of uh, criteria that um, you get, and it's defined as an acute multi-systemic vasculitis of medium-sized arteries in patients with fever, in addition to the presence of the following criteria. 
one, bilateral injection of the bulbar conjunctiva with limbic sparing and without exudates. Actually, once you've seen uh, uh, this type of conjunctivitis, you would never forget it. And it makes you begin to think that, yes, this might actually be uh, Kawasaki. Erythematous mouth and pharynx, strawberry tongue, and red cracked lips. Number two, that's uh, third the third criteria, a polymorphous generalized erythematous rash, which may be mobiliform, maculopapula, scalatiliform, or erythema multiformi-like. The fourth criteria, changes in the peripheral extremities consisting of erythema of the palms and soles and firm, sometimes painful in duration of the hands and feet, often with periungal discrimination within two to three weeks after fever onset. And the fifth criteria with the fever is acute, non-separative, usually unilateral anterior cervical lymphadenopathy. This is not a very, very common, uh, the fifth criteria is not, most of the time, not uh, really uh, very common. So as we said, bulbar um, conjunctivitis, and there is a limbic sparing. If you look in the child with Kawasaki, the area by the iris, it's almost like the injection just stops at a point and there's this mark, sharp debarkation around the iris, you know, uh, of the limbic uh, sparing. And most of the time they have no exudate with that type of uh, conjunctivitis. And then we said erythematous mouth and pharynx. In fact, for one of our cases, it was a boy and you would almost think that he had lipstick on. That was how pink his um, lips were. And then the strawberry tongue. Then there's a widespread rash which is, could be any form, could be mobiliform, could be um, papula, could be erythema multiformi-like, all right? And changes in the peripheral extremities, um, swelling actually of uh, the dosum or, or of the, uh, the palms and the soles, and sometimes extremely painful. In fact, with one of the kids that we saw, the child refused to walk because it was just too painful to walk. And then they begin to discriminate, uh, to, to begin to peel within two to three weeks after the onset of the fever. And of course, the non-superative, um, uh, usually unilateral anterior cervical uh, lymphadenopathy. And of course, the big one is the coronary aneurysm or coronary vessel involvement. And these are the images of one of the patients that we saw. You could see that the tongue actually appeared like a strawberry skin when they opened their mouth. And sometimes you get this with scarlet uh, fever. And then uh, the peeling, this was uh, when he was home, the parents sent this uh, to Ross to say that, you know, the skin uh, was uh, peeling off. So epidemiology, it's been described on every continent and across all races. It varies by geographical zones. It higher incidence in the Asian countries of Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. And they do, usually, I think this was a 2010 incidence of 243 per 100,000 children in Taiwan and in the Asian countries. In the USA, the incidence is about 17.5 to 20.8 per 100,000 children less than five years of age. In Europe is less, five to 10 per 100,000 children less than five years of age. There was no available data for its incidence in Africa, Middle East and Latin America. It was exciting to see that there were been a number of reported cases in uh, Nigeria. Um, one of interest to me was the one by Anima Shadown et al. Described eight cases over a span of five years. And these were managed at three main hospitals in Lagos, uh, Lasso, uh, Reddington, and I believe Premier Hospitals were the uh, three hospitals that were mentioned in the journal. It was quite an interesting read for me. So most common in the second year of life, we got an age range of three months to four years. In fact, the four month old was quite interesting for us to make that diagnosis, we actually went back into, uh, you know, just to check and be sure that really there have been reported cases. And yes, we were able to find that even in Japan, they've had cases of children less than one year of age. And they're most of the time they present with the atypical uh, Kawasaki. All right. And it's uncommon be beyond nine years of age. But there was another syndrome that was described during the COVID pandemic that is called the multi-systemic inflammatory syndrome in children or MISC as it's reported. And these kids actually had symptoms almost similar to Kawasaki. Almost all organs were involved and um, it looked like Kawasaki but not 
completely Kawasaki. So they were not really called Kawasaki, but they were called multi-systemic inflammatory syndrome in children. We saw a case in a child of 11 years of age, uh, you know, um, even though we say that uh, Kawasaki is usually less than five years of age, but uh, MISC does occur in children older than um, the age range for Kawasaki. Boys are more affected commonly than girls with a male to female ratio of 1.5 to one. Um, no established cause has been found. It's thought to be of an infectious process. In fact, in Japan, they thought that it was more a disease of the middle and upper class, uh, that they found that there was more incidence um, in uh, these uh, cases. And that there might actually be some kind of genetic predisposition because they said they found that uh, when they did a, a long-term study that parents who had Kawasaki as children actually also had kids that was with uh, Kawasaki. So we said to make a diagnosis that I said, there is no uh, lab test for say, to say that this is diagnostic of Kawasaki, but you know, there is a criteria. And if you meet the criteria, then you, you treat for Kawasaki. So fever usually better than 30 points of, and it's usually for more than five days duration. And four or five of the features that we've mentioned about the conjunctivitis, um, the rash, the swelling of the hand. If, so by the time you put all, any four or five of those features together, then you can make a diagnosis of Kawasaki. And other significant findings are carditis, diarrhea, arthralgia, proteinuria, or sterile pyuria, leukocytosis, a slight decrease in hemoglobin levels, as you saw in the two cases we had, increased ESR, usually more than 40, or elevated CRP. I actually prefer to use CRP because after, I think it's 150 or 190, the, a the ASR, um, apparatus cannot give you a number anymore. So um, if for instance now it's, I don't know, more than 250, it will just keep on reading 190 or 150 throughout. And you can't use that even to monitor how well your child is, uh, the patient is doing. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, thrombocytosis. Um, in yeah. cases they've reported of uh, some children are actually having platelet counts of uh, close to a million. And then the incomplete or atypical Kawasaki, all right? These usually more in infants. And you made this diagnosis, if you have fever greater than two days with two or three of the above mentioned criteria we discussed before, or, and it's been said that even if you have a child yeah. or an infant or fever without cause, that it might be wise to go ahead and get an echo. Because if they have evidence of coronary artery involvement, then you can make your diagnosis of Kawasaki, or if they have laboratory test results of elevated CRP or ESR, and three or more of the following lab findings, anemia, platelet count of less than, of more than 450,000, albumin of um, less than three grams per DL, elevated liver function, uh, white blood cell count of more than 15,000, or sterile pyuria, then if you have any of these, a criteria and you have a, an infant with fever without a cause and coronary artery involvement, then you can go ahead and make a diagnosis of Kawasaki. In fact, the American um, Heart Association did um, set out a, 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 an algorithm that can be used for people preventing with the not so typical um, features uh, that meet the clinical criteria for Kawasaki. And this is, I reproduced it from, um, one of the texts uh, that I use. So if um, you have two or more symptoms or you have elevated CRP and you get an echo and echo is positive with coronary artery involvement, please go ahead and treat as a Kawasaki. So Kawasaki could actually present in three phases. Um, you know, with our system, um, our parents, um, you know, they've seen one doctor, they're not happy with them or they feel that that doctor is not doing what they feel, they go to another doctor. And that's really what happened with us. You know, We saw the, 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 the infant uh, twice. And just because the mom was not, she just felt something was not right. She went to another hospital. Thank God for collaboration. And us and the other hospital were able to make the diagnosis of Kawasaki just based on being able to share information. So, and depending on what, when you're seeing the child, 
you can actually make a diagnosis or when you're seeing the patient uh, uh, diagnosis of Kawasaki, there is the acute phase. And that's when we have the fever, we have the oropharyngeal erythema, we have the swelling of the hands and the feet, polymorphous erythematous rash and the cervical adenopathy. Those criteria that we talked about, that's in the acute phase. In the subacute phase, this is usually after 10 to 12 days of the illness. Fever would have subsided then. You, you still notice fissuring, cracking of the lips and this formation of the skin, especially of the fingers and the toes. And then the convalescent stage usually begins approximately 25 days after the onset of the illness, absence of all the clinical illness of the disease, but there might still be a residual inflammatory markers, that means elevated ESR and uh, CRP. <laughs> and what are the differential diagnoses? Measles or rubella, that's the first thing. Um, looking through some of the cases that you know we eventually diagnosed as Kawasaki in our establishment, about two of them were initially diagnosed as measles, okay? And just because, uh, you know, the conjunctivitis, the cough, the congestion and all of that could happen also in measles and the rash, all right? But the typical, we know the typical rash for measles starts from the uh, head and then just moves down and then after a while it disappears, okay? Scarlet fever, this is strep throat with the rash. And you know, for scarlet fever, they have the typical strawberry tongue appearance. So even seeing that now, remember that uh, the four month old that I presented that, you know, because of the erythema and the injection of the oropharynx, the pediatrician that saw just made a diagnosis of tonsillitis. Uh, Stevens Johnson syndrome, especially if they're reacting to certain medications, staphylococcal toxin syndrome and staphylococcal toxic shock syndrome. These are, um, illnesses that could actually be differential, differential diagnosis or could simulate um, uh, Kawasaki, then other viral exanthems and infectious mononucleosis. Viral exanthems like the adenovirus, um, yes, the infectious mononucleosis, these are the differential diagnoses to think about and uh, before making a diagnosis of uh, Kawasaki or you know, to guide as one begins to think towards, uh, to lean towards Kawasaki disease. Then the laboratory findings, in acute phase, there might be elevated white blood cells with left shift. And it's not unusual to see white blood cells of 15 to 20,000, all right? In almost all cases, um, you know, that I've been involved in, we still have the kids on parenteral antibiotics, you know, pending when we get all our cultures back. Elevated ESR, um, even greater than 150 uh, has been found. Increased C-reactive protein, they usually have a mild nomochromic pneumocytic anemia, okay? Sterile pyuria, trace proteinuria or hematuria may occur, elevated serum bilirubin, hypoalbuminemia, thrombocytopenia early on, but significant thrombocytosis by the second week of the illness, and hyponatremia. These are the common laboratory findings uh, with Kawasaki. Echocardiogram. In fact, to because of the threat or of a coronary artery aneurysm, it's always wise if you're thinking Kawasaki to get an early echo so that it helps to uh, determine how long or what exactly uh, uh, the treatment modalities would be if we're going to do IVIG or we're going to just do high dose aspirin and for how long will this child be on aspirin just to prevent aneurysm or clots. All right, this must be done for any case of presumed Kawasaki or any infant with fever greater than seven days. Baseline echo is warranted once you have a diagnosis of Kawasaki. And there has been evidence of coronary artery involvement, which could be apparent from the fifth to the seventh day of the illness. In fact, for almost all the cases that we saw, there was some element of coronary artery involvement, but none with um, aneurysm. Most of the time they were dilatation. And we usually we have a cardiologist uh, with us managing the case. So treatment, two main modalities of treatment once the diagnosis is made or confirmed. High dose aspirin, which we can get everywhere. IVIG infusion, which is almost impossible to get. I don't know if Dr. Little remembered, there was a case um, under his health care plan of Kawasaki that we needed IVIG infusion for, and it was no little feat <laughs> getting the IVIG infusion. Now, a vial, of, um, a vial is 10 grams. And that 10 grams, the dosage for uh, IVIG infusion in Kawasaki is two grams per kilogram body weight. All right, so if we have a 10 kg child, that means we need 20 grams 
all right? One vial is 10 grams, and that one vial is 250,000 Naira. So that means that if just to treat this, IV, this child, we need 500,000 Naira to even get that IVIG infusion. So you can understand why in Japan they said it was a disease of the rich, all right? High dose high screen in range of 80 milligrams per kilogram body weight divided every six hours to 48 hours after the last viral episode. And this is reduced to daily aspirin dose of three to five milligrams per kilogram per day. Usually the cardiologist will tell us to take this for at least a minimum of six weeks or until they repeat the echo and they give us a clean bill, bill of health to say to stop it. Then the IVIG infusion is at two grams, it's a two grams per kilogram, and this is infused over a 10 to 12 hour period. I routinely like to uh, pre-dose the patient with an antihistamine. Uh, we use diphenhydramine um, uh, parenterally here uh, in our hospital, you know, just to prevent any unusual reaction. And then if there is coronary artery involvement, low dose aspirin is continued for six to eight weeks, still follow up with the cardiologist. And of course, symptomatic and supportive care. As I said, for all our cases, we still had them on IV antibiotics, even though we gave them the IVIG. And this is the end of my talk. Uh, I'm just going to allow if there are any other questions, then I'm going to bring the poll back so that we can now, just to see how, you know, based on what we've talked about, uh, what we can all uh, remember that I have said. Thank you so much. If there are any questions, uh, anyone we can just uh, either put it in the chat box or um, with a raise, raise the hand. Thank you very much, Dr. Waje. Uh, now I'm sure we've had a nice time listening to you. Uh, Dr. Iriti, if you are one, can they take over? I don't think Dr. Fajolu is on, on with us right now. Please, if you have any questions, kindly raise your digital hand or put your questions in the chat box so that uh, Dr. Waji can answer directly. Thank you. Okay. Okay, good night, ma'am. All right, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Dr. Amala, are you asking a question? Okay, I'm going to launch the poll again and then we'll see if we um, are relaunch. Uh, Professor Grinch, good afternoon, oh. ma'am. Please go ahead, ma'am. <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> um, first, let me congratulate you uh, for launching this um, wonderful project. And, um, you know, I join um, Dr. Jenny Fuja, who actually, well, is the joining of uh, pediatrics um, in saying that this is a great landmark for pediatricians particularly those who are practicing um, in private, in the private sector. Um, I, before I ask, I have a question, but before I ask the question, I just want to say that, you know, as pediatricians in the private sector, we are very, very important. I am not practicing right now. So <laughs> I have retired and I mean it um, because it takes a lot to practice anywhere in pediatrics. You have to continue, continually um, improve your knowledge and skills. And I feel that um, you can use the, I, the, the, the opportunity of um, this internet 
to actually interact more. And I'm glad that it has started. Uh, in, in the past, the main difference between practice in, the, uh, in private and practice in hospital is that um, when you are practicing in private, you are on your own. Whereas in the hospital, you could always, you know, invite consultants from various um, disciplines, etc., to help you have a look at the patients. So I believe that we should take full advantage of the uh, digital uh, opportunities. So having said that, my specific question has to do with with um, diagnosing Kawasaki in an environment where we have uh, tropical problems, tropical illnesses, particularly malaria um, and other problems that may not, uh, you cannot diagnose immediately or with simple techniques. So obviously then, you would have to uh, do your diagnosis by um, exclusion, exclusion, as usual. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I see you're laughing. You know that that's usually what we have been doing. You know, we treat yes. for malaria, treat for this and that. And I wonder, you know, you could yes. actually um, make some comments on that area because it is very, very important for those for the younger doctors who are practicing out there to know that you cannot um, afford not to think of common things that occur commonly first. Okay. Um, so that is that. And secondly, um, in interpreting the hematological findings, uh, I believe that what you are actually finding out is that this is a, a kind of non-specific immunological um, infection or whatever it is, you know, which yes. can be brought on by any anything any any <laughs> agent. So, tell me what we you know from the literature if if this has been um, discovered and how often. Um, this has happened. Thank you. Uh, but by the way, let me just congratulate you. That was a brilliant presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ma. I don't know if you remember, I was your house officer at Luth. We <laughs> met a number of times at uh, AAP conferences. I always walk up to you. We met in Chicago several times. So it's always a great privilege and a great honor, Ma, to come to see you. Yes, and in my literature, in the literature uh, search that I did, um, the thinking may be viral, um, etiology, um, and they're also suggesting because of what has happened during the COVID uh, uh, period where we're having elevated inflammatory markers uh, post COVID infection, that could this also, this is tailing more towards some kind of viral etiology. Uh, th that's what I was able to, to find. And I think even um, cases were reported after COVID of uh, children presenting almost similar to Kawasaki and uh, finding out that they actually tested positive for COVID or had COVID um, um, exposure. And I think that was when it was called the MISC, Multi-Systemic uh, Inflammatory Syndrome um, Infection in Children. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, there's quite a lot of mystery about Kawasaki, isn't there? But anyway, we, it will be unfolded gradually, you know, by people like so. you who are working on it. And um, <laughs> but, but um, really, there's still a lot more to be looked at environmentally and genetically. Probably. Yes, there's, there's yeah. some genetic uh, predisposition. Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm. Well, 
Dr. Onifade. You, sorry, before yeah. I, before I forget, um, I want to thank um, uh, Dr. Mobola Jilawa for launching this. Thank you. And Dr. Lechu for coming to the assistance. Um, usually, we are we feel daunted by this uh, digital manipulations and all that. So I'm glad you came to uh, uh, you know his assistance. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you are welcome, ma. You are welcome, ma. And thank you, thank you so much for your support and encouragement. It's it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Yes, I do. I do have um, a comment and um, perhaps a question. I am so excited uh, to be part of this group. It's uh, been a long time coming and I just want to thank the people who, Dr. Mobile Jilawal, I should say, not the people who initiated it. Thank you very much. Um, like Professor Granger, I'm now retired too in my young age. <laughs> but I mean, Dr. Uwaje, thank you very yes, much for your presentation. It's a wonderful presentation. And um, I just wanted to uh, say in response to what Dr. Uh, Professor Green said, the Kawasaki is a clinical diagnosis. Unfortunately, there's no diagnostic test for it. Here, when we, we see patients with suspected um, uh, Kawasaki, what we do is we speak to the immunologist and we speak to the infectious disease people and they help us put everything into perspective so that we can be certain that we are dealing with Kawasaki. So it's not just one person. And I was so pleased to hear that, uh, making the diagnosis, I mean, I was so pleased to hear that um, yeah, there was some kind of uh, interaction with groups yes. of pediatricians. But my question goes to the giving of the IVIG. IVIG, like you said to us, is pretty expensive, is difficult uh, to get in Nigeria. So it must be handled perfectly, which means that our nurses, who are the ones giving the infusion, have to be involved in the care, you know, in the care of these patients. Could you tell uh, us? how you monitor the patients who are on IVIG. You did say to us that your dose is two, milligram, two grams per, um, per kg, and yes. that a 10 kilogram child would need um, 10, uh, 20 grams. So yes. how do you get your nurses to monitor these patients closely so that they don't have any uh, complications from the infusion of the IVIG? Um, here, we would use the news uh, uh, or pews to monitor the patient. If you could please tell us how the monitoring well, in my takes hospital, place. Um, the, once we have a diagnosis of uh, Kawasaki and uh, yeah. we're going to uh, procure the IVIG, uh, usually we pre-medicate uh, the child with uh, an antihistamine and also uh, um, hydrocortisone. Okay, and um, we use an infusion pump. Of course, the child is on a CP monitor and uh, we run it over a, a 10 to 12 hour period. And during those hours, uh, the nurses, it's usually a one-to-one -one nurse, they're monitoring the um, temperature, um, they can see the pulse and the heart rate on the monitor and they keep uh, writing that uh, uh, down. And they let us know if any untoward reaction um, you know, occurs, uh, the, you know, we have, usually we let them, the dosage of the epi for the child in case we're going to have an anaphylaxis, all of that is already pre-drawn and labeled during the period uh, that we're giving the IVIG. Thank you, it's Thank just, you I, I wanted us to appreciate the fact that it's not just the doctors making the diagnosis, every member of the healthcare team is quite, is very important in the care of these patients. Um, and we have to carry our nurses along. And also post-infusion, uh, 
we, we make sure that we um, let the parents know, we give them a leaflet to go home with, to let them know what exactly IVIG meant. It's, um, you know, pulled, um, you know, antibodies from humans and all of that. And also uh, they have a two day follow up with us and then a one week follow up, all right? Uh, one week after they go to see the cardiologist, because they're already on aspirin, we let them know that if uh, incidents of rise uh, syndrome and all that with taking aspirin. And we also inform the parents that the child cannot take any live vaccine within a year of taking the IVIG. So the post discharge instruction is also very important. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Nifadi. I'm not sure you're retired yet because you don't look tired, just like prof, prof as well. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ajit, there are some comments. There's a comment and there's a question for you on the chat box. One says you should kindly introduce yourself because there are some pediatricians who don't know you. And the other question is, are there other causes of coronary heart disease in children? Heart dilatation. Yes. Um, I know that uh, Kawasaki is the most common cause of acquired um, cardiac disease, not in our environment, but in the developed world. You know, so, um, in terms of other causes, I probably have to will throw it out to the floor. Um, I don't know. Okay, so um, my name is Dr. Atinuke Waje. I was. Uh, left Ife uh, in 1989. Um, I did my um, house job at uh, Luth. That was where I was privileged to be on the uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Grange. And then I went to Howard University Hospital for my residency training. And I did a year of pediatric emergency fellowship at the University of Chicago. Uh, Practice in the US up until 2011, that was about 20 years and then relocated to Nigeria in 2011. And I'm, um, you know, uh, Nigerian patients are worth it. So I'm here to stay. <laughs> oh, my practice is Pediatric Partners Hospital and we're in Victoria Island, Lagos. Thank you very much. Dr. Mubalaji Nawal, do you want to say something? Well, um, yeah, just to um, thank the uh, presenter for a, an excellent presentation and, uh, you know, setting a very good standard uh, for the future meetings and to, um, to appreciate the, the very nice encouraging comments from everyone, um, you know, it's, it's very gratifying that um, uh, we have started this and uh, it will encourage all of us to push the frontiers further. Um, there are so many other uh, bigger um, or wider goals which this group can uh, uh, you know, achieve, which I didn't mention in my uh, address deliberately, but uh, they will unfold as we go along. Um, we just thought it was better to uh, concentrate on the clinical aspect because it is the place where we can uh, easily achieve the most with the with this kind of effort so yeah so i'm very pleased with with the ongoings and uh, i thank you dr elito for uh, anchoring the whole program so well along with the team of coordinators thank you thank you very much sir dr waje can you share the result of the poll maybe we'll take it again i think i've uh... Oh, okay. All right. So it's been, we've, I think we just, some, we still have a few more people if they want to take this poll. I think once we reach about 50% of us, then we can end the poll. Uh, okay. Uh, we have 14 people so far who have um, yes. attempted. So we need just two more people to get to 50%. And then we can share the results. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. Uh, so. Well, are there any more takers? Well, I guess we probably should end it now. And then All share right. The so we'll end the poll.
Oh, okay. There's there's a hand up. There's a hand up. Uh, we're done. Can you unmute and ask your question? Okay. okay. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Mishak Bolashiri Olawi. I'm of Clay Pediatric Consulting Lekki, but I also consult for the Premier Specialist Medical Center. I just want to lend my voice to everything that is going on in this group. And I want to say this is highly commendable. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Mubolaji Johnson, who initiated this, and uh, <laughs> Dr. Leto, who is uh, assisting him. It's a very good thing. I like it. Now, Dr. Uwaje, thank you so much for your presentation as well. Uh, it, it was quite uh, interesting and, um, well, thought provoking as well. Uh, I think I've had to manage three cases of uh, Kawasaki. And um, I will tell you this one thing I find very challenging each time I have, to, I, I actually don't ever pray to have to treat Kawasaki <laughs> because my major concern is finance. When I was with Reddington Hospital, I remember the case we had then, Reddington had to pay because this patient could not afford. Uh, initially, we seemed like we said, okay, we will do the treatment on credit and then get you to pay uh, over time, but I can tell for certain, I had to beg the management of Reddington to just please let go. I'm glad we were able to treat this patient successfully, but the finance is what I will never forget. And um, so now we're in an environment where we all know finance is a big problem. And um, I don't know what to do about this. I hope at some point this group will be an advocate to getting some of these expensive things we need to use, especially the IVIG in the treatment of, of course, not just um, uh, what's it called, not just Kawasaki. There are other conditions that will require expensive treatment, but this is a big challenge for us as a country. So I'm hoping at some point, this group will be able to stand as a voice to government or whoever will need to help out in getting some of these things to the country in a cheaper way. I don't know if it has to be subsidized or something. So good as it is for us to know how to diagnose uh, Kawasaki, how do you treat someone who cannot afford and I can say for certain that most HMOs will not want to take on such. They will easily, I, I think this was what happened in this particular case. It was supposed to be an HMO patient, but they said that bit, they were sorry they would not be able to handle. So this is my take. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Waje, incidentally, I didn't even remember the case we managed together but I can tell you that um, we had to struggle to get our funds for you. <laughs> and we're happy that the patient- <laughs> Now you remember. <laughs> I remember now. We're happy yes. that the patient got well and went home. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Yes. Uh, you can share the, the results and then- uh, Okay. So we can wrap up. So a three-year-old, which of the clinical findings below best supports Kawasaki? And they answer, they answer, well, the majority said bilateral non-exudative conjunctivitis, and that really is the correct choice. Uh, then you are aware that other conditions can cause a similar clinical pattern in your evaluation of this child. Which of the following condition is initially most likely to be confused with Kawasaki? Especially in our, our environment, yes rubella, measles. You order laboratory tests to add further diagnostic insights. Which of the following findings strengthen your impression that the child has Kawasaki disease? And we, yeah, very large number, elevated ESR. Uh, sorry. Okay, number four. A three-year-old girl meets clinical criteria for Kawasaki disease. 
you realize that the greatest threat to her is coronary artery disease. So the best choice for initial imaging of the coronary arteries is C, echocardiogram. Thank you all so very much. Thank you very much. Um, we look forward to the next presentation, which will be July the 27th. We already have um, a team ready, and it's exciting to know that um, we, are, we are in for business. Leo, I will hand over to you so that you can conclude the program. Thank you very much. Okay, um, it's indeed my pleasure to um, congratulate all of us for this um, great beginning of what we, we all agree is a laudable project that we hope will continue um, for a very long time to uh, upgrade our knowledge, for those of us in private practice. Um, it's very pertinent at this time as well to thank in the most special way the initiator of this um, program, Dr. Mogulaji Lawal. Um, and also to thank all the eminent pediatricians who have lent their support to this project, Dr. Jenny Fuja, Professor Grange, um, all, all those who have locally and just by those in diaspora, Dr. Nifadi, who had made the, the, the effort to be here. We have benefited a lot from this uh, presentation. So we are giving uh, kudos to Dr. Waje and the excellent work she's done. Very clear, concise, educative presentation. And she set a mark that other presenters would have to, to beat uh, or to emulate as the case may be. And we're really, we're really happy of the interest this series um, has uh, generated amongst pediatricians across the country and abroad. And as um, Dr. Mulajit has hinted, other aspects of the program will be uh, made known. And we are up for suggestions as to how we can improve the continuing medical education of pediatricians in private practice so that we do not go rusty, we do not go buried in just clinical, practical work and not um, know what is trending. And most especially as we've seen with this case of Kawasaki, is that we can also broaden our horizon and think outside the box so that we're not fixated on just the common things we see, which we agree, common things occur commonly, but we should have that also that aspiration to look beyond the ordinary and see what else it, it could be. So I want to thank everyone for visually listening and participating. And I'm sure we've all benefited so much from this exercise. So I'll gladly hand you over back to uh, Dr. Eletu for the final closing remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Leo. Um, a big thank you to each and every one of us again for the first uh, in the series, and I'm happy with the turnout. We had, over we had about 36 pediatricians online to join this presentation. The next presentation will be on the 27th, like I said. We have a team in place, and um, we will definitely communicate to you uh, very soon. Dr. Mubalajilawa will send out some pass out some information to you as well, probably next week, as to other things that you would uh, be involved in. Thank you very much. Dr. Mubalajilawa, I don't know if you want to have one or two more words. Um, no, no, um, not really. Just to thank you so much for a great job well done, and um, especially your committee. And um, to wish everybody a, a good week ahead and to, to go to keep us the next time we meet. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. So, so bye. Bye bye. Bye. I've got to be. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, sir. <laughs> Hello, sir. How are you? It's been a great day. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? <laughs>
Good afternoon, sir. No, good afternoon. <laughs> How are you? Fine, baby, sir. Good afternoon. you. Leo, how's it? Sir. How are you, sir? Good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Great. Well done, sir. Yes, sir. All right, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye, sir. Bye bye. Bye. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> Hold on, Leo.